Well, good evening, congregation. And welcome to this time of worship. It's nice to be in Anala this morning, but it's uh, very nice to be back in your midst. Our call to worship this evening comes from, the, from Isaiah, uh, Isaiah uh, 55, where we hear these words. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I send it. We've come this evening to seek the Lord and to call on him. Uh, let's do that now as we come in silent and individual prayer, uh, as we prepare our hearts to worship. So let's pray, pray silently and individually. Lord our God, we come to praise you that, that you are not like us, uh, for we know that, that your thoughts are not our thoughts. Uh, your thoughts are so much higher and greater and more pure and righteous than any of our thoughts ever are. Lord, our, our thoughts are that we, we love that which is lovely. Your thoughts are that you love that which is unlovely. You're the God who sets your love upon sinners and the ungodly, and takes them to yourself. Our thoughts are so often that we need to work to secure your love and your favor, and yet your thoughts are that you freely give your love and your favor apart from anything we have done, despite all of our undeserving. Lord, our, our thoughts are so often that we, we hold it against someone when they wrong us. We seek to, to make them pay. Lord, but your thoughts are that you are willing to forgive when we wrong you. Lord, you are the God who has mercy and who freely pardons, and you don't make us pay. But Lord, uh, Jesus has paid the price for all of our sin. Lord, uh, our thoughts are that we get impatient with, with people uh, not changing, and we, we say, why bother with them? And Lord, your thoughts are that you are so patient with us, giving us time to change and never casting us away. But Lord, you, you pick us up and help us carry on. Lord, our, our thoughts are so often that uh, things don't change, that, that, that not much happens when your word is read or preached. Uh, but your thoughts are different. And Lord, we know that your word will accomplish the purpose for which uh, you have sent it. And so we, we pray that as your word goes out... Uh, today from, from this pulpit and, and from many, many places uh, that your word will uh, accomplish its purpose and that your purpose for us this evening would be to build us up in our faith, to, to help us to know you and Lord, to, to transform our lives uh, through your precious word and by your marvellous grace and through the power of your Holy Spirit. So be with us, we pray as we worship, we ask this in Jesus' name as we say together, Amen. Congregation, could you please stand? And again, as we uh, gather uh, in the presence of our, our Lord and our God, our King and our Redeemer, He greets His people saying grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to sing together the words, uh, book, book of Worship uh, 153, Blessed Jesus, at your word we are gathered to hear you. So let's lift our voices and sing together.
seated. We're going to be thinking about the scriptures this evening, and so uh, we're going to look at some scripture passages, but before we do that, we're going to uh, recite the words of uh, Belgic Confession Article uh, 2 together, and uh, I invite you to uh, respond uh, as we confess together uh, what we believe about the Word of God, and in particular, uh, what we believe about how God reveals Himself to us. Let's say together, we know Him by two means. First, by the creation, preservation, and government of the universe. Since that universe is before our eyes, like a beautiful book, in which all creatures, great and small, are as letters to make us ponder the invisible things of God, His eternal power and His divinity. As the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1.20, all these things are enough to convict men and to leave them without excuse. Second, He makes Himself known to us more openly by His holy and divine word as much as we need in this life for his own glory and for the salvation of his own. And now let's uh, turn to the scriptures together and uh, read a couple of passage that, passages that teach us about scripture. So first is 2 Timothy uh, and then we're in uh, Hebrews 4. So 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3. Uh, here, of course, Paul is, is writing to Timothy and he's writing about uh, his uh, ministry and how he's to discharge his ministry. Uh, so, 2 Timothy 3, we'll pick up the reading at verse 12. Let's hear God's word together. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And now let's turn to uh, Hebrews uh, 4. So just a few pages over. First and second Timothy, Titus and Philemon, Hebrews, um, Hebrews uh, 4. And we're just going to pick up the reading from verse uh, 12 uh, of Hebrews 4. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. We're thinking about what the Bible says uh, about God's Word and now we're going to uh, sing about what the Bible says about God's Word. We're going to use uh, the words of Thy Word as a, a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So let's uh, stand and sing together.
spend some time now uh, thanking the Lord our God for uh, His Word. Uh, and we're also going to be thanking the Lord our God for a, a new addition to the congregation. Uh, so H Hannah and Ben were, were blessed with, uh, you guessed it, a baby boy. Uh, <laughs> this afternoon at, at 1.50, um, as of this point, uh, unnamed. So we'll, we'll give thanks for the blessing of, of new life for, uh, for Ben and Hannah. So let's uh, come to God uh, in prayer. Will you pray with me? Lord our God, we are so thankful that you are the God who speaks to us, that we have this God-inspired word in our hands, that all through the ages you've preserved your word, and that we've, we're blessed with translators who've put it in our language, and we can read it whenever we want. We have all that we need in it uh, to know you and to enjoy you. Lord, we praise you that your word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And we pray that it might be active in, in our midst and in our hearts, convicting us of sin, transforming us within, striking us afresh with your glory, with your goodness and your grace. Lord, um, our lives and uh, times change so quickly. Uh, we recognize that this world is always in a state of flux and so we thank you that your word doesn't change. In the shifting sands of this world, it remains the same. And Lord, we pray that your word might be a rich comfort to those whose lives are in a state of flux. Uh, we think of those uh, waiting for surgery. We think of Ed and Liz Alexander. And we uh, pray that in your mercy, you would grant success to the procedures in the coming week. And, and Lord, that your word might be a real light to them at this time. Lord, how can the young keep their way pure? By living according to your word. And so we pray for the purity of our young people. In a world that bombards them with false messages about sexuality, may you keep them and their hearts. Guard them, we pray. Lord, we pray that our young people might learn how to use your word as the sword of the spirit that you, you'd give them a love for your word and they'd be able to use it to, to serve you and to ward off temptation. Lord, we uh, give you uh, all thanks and praise for new life for Ben and Hannah we, and the boys and we, we thank you uh, for adding another boy to their family and, and we pray uh, that, that he might grow to love your word and, and cherish it and know you through it. Lord, we praise you that your word is not chained it's not a, a word that's shackled, that there's no uh, boundaries of countries can uh, stop it from coming in. And so we, we, we pray that your, your word, that the gospel may go forth in Australia and might reap a harvest. Lord, we uh, pray for those um, living in North Africa. Uh, and, and Lord, we, we pray for those who broadcast the word uh, into that place and that there too your word would reap a harvest. Lord, we thank you that the word is not restricted by our own inadequacies in explaining it. Uh, that when we witness for you, it's, it's not our eloquence or, or speech that persuades, but uh, it's, it's your word uh, working by the power of your Holy Spirit. And so we, we pray that as we seek to witness in our workplaces, in our families, in our neighbourhoods, uh, Lord, that, that you would use us. Lord, we, we pray for those who handle the word of truth, for, for ministers of the word and, and for elders. Uh, that you enable us, uh, us to handle that word well, that we might not be ashamed, that we might correctly handle the word of truth. We, we thank you for um, Pastor Craig and for his ministry in Anala. We pray that you would bless uh, his labours, equip him with all he needs to serve you, and that he might find joy in his work. We pray for those uh, vicars in our denomination who are being uh, trained uh, as ministers, and we pray that there too uh, you would equip them uh, for future service. We ask, Lord, that as we uh, gather around your word Sunday by Sunday, that you would work in each of our lives. Uh, Lord, we, we don't simply want to hear your word and, and be puffed up with, with knowledge that we know lots of things. Uh, we want your word to, to penetrate uh, into the deepest places of our hearts. Uh, so we pray that uh, you would cause your word to come to us this night with, with power and with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. We pray this in Jesus' name as we say together. Amen. We're going to sing.
as we uh, prepare to, to come and read the word again. And we're going to sing uh, the words of Speak, O Lord. And we'll remain uh, seated as we sing together. Let's uh, turn together to that word now. Uh, we're going to read from Psalm uh, 19 this evening. Psalm 19, page uh, 70, 80, 783 of the Church Bibles. Uh, our text won't be the whole psalm. Uh, we'll be focusing on verses um, 7 uh, through 11. But we'll read the whole psalm so we get a sense of the uh, context of the passage that we're looking at. Psalm 19, let's hear God's word together. For the director of music, a, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, 
enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So far the reading. It'd be good if you keep your Bibles open as we have a look at this passage this evening. Uh, one of the things that uh, I do, uh, and I'm sure many of you do it as well when I'm considering uh, purchasing a book, is I look on the back and have a read through uh, some of the blurbs, you know, those pithy uh, little statements that are trying to uh, summarize us and entice us to, to read the book. And particularly if I trust a person writing uh, the, the blurb, uh, their recommendation will, will lure me into a purchase. Uh, we know that sometimes blurbs can just be all hype. You know, if you only read one book this year, make it this one. It's that important. It's probably not. Uh, sometimes uh, blurbs are there just to stimulate interest. About the Hunger Games, someone wrote, I was hooked after reading just the first pages. I loved the book and couldn't put it down. Finished it in just one day. Sometimes uh, blurbs tell you the, the kind of book you'll be reading. So someone wrote this, this blurb about the book Gilead. Lyrical and meditative, potently contemplative. You know that you're not going to read an action block blockbuster there, don't you? Fantastic book, though. I wonder what uh, blurb you would put on the back of the Bible. What blurb would be adequate for the Scriptures? If you only read one book this year, make it this one, it's that important, that would be pretty apt. Perhaps what what God says about this book in verse 10 would fit perfectly as well, wouldn't it? Verse 10, here is a book more precious than gold, than pure gold. Here is a book sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. That, that blurb is, is fitting uh, for what we, we hold in our hands. The scriptures, we're told, are better than money and honey. So we're talking about treasure, that, that's money. But we're also talking about pleasure, that, that's honey, things that, that delight us. And you find both treasure and pleasure right here in this book. Now, I wonder, is that how you think about the Scriptures? Uh, you all go, yeah, theologically, of course that's how we think about the Scriptures. Now, we're Reformed people, we think that. Perhaps a more pointed question is, is this how we treat the Scriptures? that they are our great treasure and our infinite pleasure. You'd rather have this book in your hands than any other book. You'd rather have this book in your hands than a bit of gold around your wrist. You'd rather have this book than more than a new car, more than a new boat. Is reading God's Word more enjoyable to you, more, more pleasurable to you than getting away for your next camping holiday? or having a day at the beach, or playing uh, whatever the latest computer game is. If the truth be told, we, we don't always live as this book is uh, our treasure and our pleasure. Sometimes Bible reading is, is the last thing on our a list of things to do. Sometimes we neglect the book. Sometimes we read it out of duty, and it's not really a delight. We know uh, verse 10 should be our attitude, and we'd like it to be our attitude. But, but we know we've, we've all got room for growth, do we not? So this evening we're, we're going to start a, a series of studies on the Scriptures. Uh, as, as elders, we, we want to uh, encourage the congregation in, in Bible reading. Uh, and I think, could we not all do with some encouragement in, in our reading of the Scriptures? And, and I, could, I could just stand here and tell you, you need to read the Bible. You know you need to read the Bible. And I could tell you, you've got to set aside a quiet time, and this is how you, you schedule it. And I could tell you, you're not going to grow if you don't read the Bible. You're going to shrivel up spiritually. But I want to take the approach the psalmist uses to 
encourage us in the word. And that is, what does he do? Well, he sets before us this, this vision, this vision of how wonderful this book is. And, and if this vision captures us, then, then naturally we, we want to engage with the word and, and read from it. Uh, it'll, it'll drive us to, to mine this book for the gold it contains and to, to, to try and taste the, the pleasure that is found in the scriptures. Um, I just want a quick word on the, on the psalm as a whole. Uh, psalm 19 uh, speaks of the, the two ways God reveals himself to us. In the first six verses, it speaks of the way that he reveals himself to us in creation. And that's the never-ending sermon without words, where God uh, shows the entire world how great and, and glorious he is. But, but that's a, quite a narrow revelation. In, in many ways, the psalmist is telling us it's an insufficient revelation for us. Uh, and so God also reveals himself to us in the Word. That's verses 7 to 11. And, and the Word, of course, tells us far more than the creation uh, tells us. Now, the fact that God has to reveal himself to us reminds us that the Christian faith is not about us reaching up to God and, you know, we figured him out. The Christian faith is about God reaching down to us, reaching down to reveal himself to us, reaching down to reveal himself to us in the Son. We couldn't figure God out if he didn't reveal himself to us. Reaching down to reveal himself to us in the Word. We need him to show us. And so we have the Word, uh, and there's this uh, general pattern in verses uh, 7 through 10. Firstly, we're we're told something of the character of the Word, uh, and then we're told something of the effect that this word has on us and there's six times the psalmist does this so we've got a six point sermon this evening so i hope you're comfortable firstly the law of the lord is perfect refreshing the soul Uh, typically when we think of the word perfect we think of something as faultless so a perfect score on the test means the absence of any errors but we also use the word perfect uh, in in another way we might describe the weather as, as perfect. Uh, we might describe a, a holiday or a, or a date as, as perfect. And, and what we, we mean by that is not that the, there was the complete absence of anything that was, that, was, that was bad. What we mean is that there's the presence of everything good. So, you know, everything you... A holiday is perfect. If everything you possibly wanted on that holiday was there, you, you had good weather. You got there and back safely. You know, the, the kids had a good time. You got to relax. It was, it was just perfect. doesn't mean, you know, nothing bad ever happened. And, and that's how the, the Bible uses the word perfect here. What it means is that there's nothing missing from the Scriptures. It has everything uh, you need and I need to have. It's a complete word from God. And the sense in which it's complete is that it tells us everything we need to know to be saved and everything we need to know to live as saved people. We, we don't need anything else other than the Scriptures to know God and to love Him. Uh, this, of course, is called the sufficiency of the Scriptures. The law of the Lord is perfect, is how the psalmist puts it. And, and note what effect, what effect does this, this perfect word have? It refreshes the soul. It refreshes the soul. So I don't know about you, if you've had a really tough week, what, what is it that uh, refreshes you, that peps you up and and gets you going again? Is it a a strong coffee, or or you just need a little nap for for, for 20 minutes, or you you read a book? There are all kinds of things that refresh us physically, that uh, give us back our vitality and strength. And and this is precisely the effect that the Scriptures have, spiritually speaking. They are life-giving, refreshing, and renewing. And the point is, when you're spiritually exhausted, you've suffered some setback or difficulty, your soul is low, you feel burdened, what's going to give you back your bounce? Not having a glass of wine or a tub of ice cream. It's it's coming to the Word, this this life refreshing Word. It's the perfect law of the Lord that that we need. And and if you've been walking with the Lord for a period of time, you've experienced this, you know this, this Word refreshes your soul. The same idea is actually found in Psalm 23, uh, that that Psalm we, we love so much. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. It's exactly the same word. How does the Good Shepherd restore our souls? Well, He comes and restores our souls through His Word. That's how He leads us (laughs) 
beside quiet waters and green pastures as well. He shepherds us through his words. Now, the second thing we, we see here is that the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. So, so the scriptures are trustworthy. They are, they are dependable. They're, they're, it's the truth that you can stake your entire life upon. Uh, you, we understand there are some writings in life that you, you can't stake much on. You know, you get that text message in the middle of the night. Uh, your, your post is waiting to be picked up and you just need to click on this link. Yeah, you know it's not entirely trustworthy. But we know too... Uh, that even scientific textbooks uh, don't have the entirely trustworthy quality. Uh, the texts uh, that, that I first used when I did a Bachelor of Science uh, a long, long time ago, I couldn't sell now because no one would use them. Some of the things in my textbook are no longer valid. Uh, some of the things have been proved insufficient or plain wrong. Now, the point is not so much that we ought to be science sceptics. Science is wonderful. It teaches us much truth about this world. The point is that, that this book is unique in the sense that is, it is entirely uh, trustworthy and reliable. Uh, and then see the effect. We're told uh, that it makes wise the simple. Uh, when we think of someone simple, we, we think of someone who might be a bit slow on the uptake, a few sandwiches short of a picnic. Uh, but, but you're going to understand that in the Bible, simple is not an intellectual category. It's not an intellectual category. It refers to the person who's inexperienced, uh, they are naive, they're, they're likely to be taken in by something quite easily, they're, they're a little bit green. So they're, they're in a vulnerable position. So what the dependable scriptures do is they make the gullible into someone wise. So this is what the scriptures do. They prepare us for life. You want to be prepared for life? You, you need to be in the Word. You want to be prepared to, to overcome the pitfalls and dangers? You've got to be in the Word. And of course, we, we understand that there are all kinds of uh, dangers, grave dangers to be faced in this life. And if you ignore this book, you, you're likely to fall in many different ditches. Uh, we, we know the, the nursery rhyme, or perhaps some of you know the nursery rhyme about simple Simon. Simple Simon. And if truth be told, we are all simple Simon. Uh, the simple Andrew... Simple Marty and simple John and simple Nathan. I'm allowed to pick on the elders because they won't get upset. We're, we're all simple. And what do our simple people need to be wise? We need the scriptures. We can't be wise without them. You want to prepare your kids for life? The best preparation is, is not to send them to endless music classes and sporting groups and, and social activities. It's to prepare them through the word of God, the scriptures. It makes wise the simple. We avoid dangers if we know the scriptures. We avoid theological dangers. We, we don't kind of fall for every new theological fad that's out there. You can avoid sexual danger. You'll heed God's warnings about not putting yourself in a position to be tempted. You can avoid church disillusionment because this book tells us what to expect in the church. A bunch of sinful people that are going to sin against each other. Uh, that's what happens. Congregation, you need this book to be wise, and of course it teaches us primarily how to be wise unto salvation. And you need this book because with all due respect, you're as simple as I am. And, and God has given us this book as his provision to make us wise. Now verse 8, uh, we're told there, the precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. Um, the word precept uh, contains the idea of something that's in an, an official order. So a precept is something God has laid down for us to obey, uh, to submit to, to surrender to. So, so this authoritative you know, order uh, or demand from God, what does that lead to? It leads to joy. Joy to the heart. Now, I suggest this is not the usual way we think about authority. The teenagers here don't think, mum and dad's precepts, ah, oh, joy to my heart, 10 o'clock curfew, oh, thank you, happiness. You can't have a phone uh, until you're 16 or 18 or whatever it is, oh, joy to my heart. Mum and dad teaching me to tithe, what sweet delight. That, that's not usually how we think, but this is what the psalmist is saying. Uh, God has given us this authoritative word, his, his precepts, and it gives joy-producing gladness 
to my heart and to my life. And most people think, I think the world's way of thinking is that the pathway to joy is to have no boundaries, uh, freedom from all restraint, then I can be happy. And of course, this is, this is a lie. Because if you only do uh, what you want to do, when you want to do it, when you feel like it, then you're a slave. You're a slave to yourself. And you and I are the worst kind of masters for ourselves. A life listening to your own authority, to your own precepts, is a life that leads to some pretty bitter fruit. And I think we only have to, to, to look around and you can see that. But true freedom, the freedom that comes from the gospel, is freedom from, not boundaries, but freedom from, from the guilt and power of sin. And it's being set free uh, by Christ, not to do what I want, but to do what He wants. And, and there's a joy that, that comes from submitting myself to His boundaries, to be set free to love and serve my Redeemer and my fellow creatures. That, that's the pathway to joy. That's a, the pathway we, we find here in this Word. Now, fourthly, uh, the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Radiant, giving light to the eyes. Now, commands in our day have a bad name. They're seen as too negative. Um, if I were to preach a sermon uh, on one of the commandments of God, you know, you run the risk of being called a, a legalist and, and other kinds of things. But, but for those who know the grace of God, uh, we can confess that the commands of the Lord, they are radiant. Uh, this, of course, is a, is a positive thing. Uh, power cut in the middle of the night and you've got to get up, what do you look for? You look for something, you look for a torch, something that's going to uh, give radiant light to keep you from stumbling. And the idea here, then, is that the commands of God give us guidance and direction. Um, one Bible version translates it like this, the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving insight for life. When you first become a father or a mother, you don't get an instruction manual for how to be a competent parent. But you try to read up a bit and you try and get some insight from others. And it's nice to get the insights of others when you yourself don't really have much of a clue. And we don't have much of a clue as to how to live as human beings, but, but God in His grace tells us. Um, our society struggles with that, that question, what is life for? What's the purpose of life? And so there's, there's all these answers. The, the purpose of life is for me to get as much pleasure as I want out of life straight away. Or, or life is, is, well, the purpose of life is whatever meaning I, I, I give uh, to life. Or the purpose of, of life is about making money or getting fit and having a fantastic body. Or, or life is about conforming the external reality to my inner feelings. And, and we can look around our world and, and see that, that as people live like this, it's, it's living in darkness. And, and in the midst of all this, God shines his light and, and tells us uh, our purpose. We are made for a relationship with him. We're made to know him and love him and, and, and enjoy him. He gives us light in his word. Now, fifthly, the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever, verse 9. So here we see the pattern changes a little bit uh, because it's not here talking about the word, um, it's talking about uh, a person's fear. And, and this, of course, is what the scriptures create in us a, a fear of God and an awe at his, his greatness. Uh, if you remember the series from Dr. Reeves, it creates a trembling filial fear that God is both our creator and our redeemer. So the psalmist here is still talking about the scriptures, but he's talking about the scriptures indirectly. Like this is what they do for us. They create fear in us. And this uh, fear-inducing word, we're told, endures forever. And the point here is that the word of God, it doesn't go out of style. It doesn't become redundant. Uh, you and I know that um, your iPhone or your, your digital TV in, in 50 years' time, uh, they'll, they'll be useless. You, you, you won't be using it. It'll be re redundant. But in 50 years' time, in 5,000 years' time, in 5 million years' time, the, the Word of God won't be redundant. 
If God so, so blesses you, your children's 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 children, they'll be reading from the scriptures and they'll be, they'll be finding in it the, the same timeless truths that teach us about God and teach us how, how to live in fellowship with him. They'll be finding about his way of salvation in Jesus Christ. They'll be finding that this book brings them refreshment, it brings them wisdom. It's joy and it's light just as it is for us. What did Jesus say about the word of God? Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. It's true of all of the scriptures. It'll never pass away. Now, finally, uh, we see that the decrees of the Lord are firm and all of them are righteous. Uh, And then we need to skip down to verse 11 to see the effect. By them as your servant warned in keeping them is great reward. So, a decree. A decree here is, is language from the, the law court. So uh, it, it's the judge's statement or his ruling on the case. So it's, it's not his command, it's his judgment about a certain matter. And, and God has made his righteous judgments. There's many in the scriptures. He's made his righteous judgment about what sin is, about our guilty position as sinners, about the way to be made right uh, with him, about Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation, about the eternal destiny of all human beings. And these decrees are firm. It means they're not going to change. There's no legal wrangling that, that uh, people were able to perform to, to get God to, to change his decrees, to change his judgments about his truth. Uh, and and there's, they're righteous, his decrees. They're, they're righteous. They're perfectly righteous. So there's not going to be any higher court that finds some deficiency with the righteous decrees of God and, and says, no, you can't do that that, this, that way. We're going to overturn it. Uh, and notice the, the, the effects of what God's word, his decrees are. There's a, there's a twofold effect, we're told. Uh, the psalmist says the benefit of the decrees of, of God, of the word of God, is that it's both a, a stick to, to warn us uh, and it's also a, a carrot to, to woo us. So we're, we're warned uh, by the scriptures. We're warned about the dangers of sin, about the activity of the devil, about the love of money, about the deceitfulness of our own hearts, about making life about the wrong things. But there's also a, a, a reward. And, and note verse 11 uh, doesn't say that the one who obeys God's commands will be rewarded. It actually says in the keeping the commands, there is a reward. Uh, the reward is that, that holiness itself brings its own contentment. As, as we walk in the ways of God, obeying what he says, we, we live in fellowship with him and, and we enjoy him. We have the psalmist is piling up for us these, these ideas of how wonderful this word truly is. Now, what's the point of all this instruction? Uh, is it so that we agree and go, yeah, word of God? It's a wonderful thing. No, the point is that we'd be driven to say, I want this book. I must read this book. Uh, The psalmist actually uh, uses a a word in this psalm in a very uh, shocking way. Uh, In in verse 10, uh, our translation says that God's word is more precious than gold. But it's not a very good translation. It should actually uh, be translated... Uh, God's word is to be more desired. Another way to translate that is to be more lusted after uh, than gold. The the word is actually covet. God's word should be coveted. What's the 10th commandment? Thou shalt not covet. Uh, Remember Achan's sin is that he he coveted the the stuff and hid it under his tent. Uh, We we know that uh, for for Eve, uh, she coveted the fruit of the tree because she could see that it would give her wisdom covet universal typically in the bible is a bad thing but here's a coveting that god commands thou shalt covet thou shalt covet my word there's a holy coveting a righteous craving what we might call a pure lust for the word of god that god would produce that in us let's pray for that let's work towards that let's encourage one another in that direction Now, we've been looking at the the finer details of the psalm. Uh, As we close, uh, I just want us to step back 
and look at the big picture. In verses 1 through 6, notice the name for God. Uh, when the psalmist speaks about God's revelation and creation, uh, God is called what? God. God is called God. But then, in verses 7 through 11, when the psalmist talks about what God reveals to us in the Bible, what word does he use? And, and kids, you, you'll, you'll need kind of two hands for this. Not once, twice, th- six times he calls God the Lord. The Lord, God's personal name, Yahweh. He's telling us that in the Bible we don't just meet the cosmic God who made everything. We meet, we're introduced to the covenant God. In the scriptures we get to know the great I am who I am. The Lord who enters into a covenant with human beings. The Lord who sends his son to pay the debt of our sin. The Lord who wants to bless all the families of the earth. Not curse all the families of the earth, but bless all the families of the earth with the spiritual riches that are found in in Jesus Christ. The Lord, the personal God, who is willing to condescend and to enter into a relationship with people like us and say to us, I will be your God and I will love you and I will never let you go and you will be my people. Do you understand why this book is our treasure and pleasure? Because it's about the greatest person we could ever know or have a relationship with. May we have such a hunger for our Lord that this book would be our our treasure and our pleasure. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord our God, we come to you uh, recognising that the psalmist's uh, words here Uh, that that scriptures are a a treasure and a pleasure to him. Uh, Lord, we confess that so often that's that's not our experience. But Lord, it is is what we want our experience to be. And so we we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would create in us a a hunger for yourself, a hunger to to know you better, uh, a hunger to, to know your will, a hunger to have fellowship with you, a hunger to see that, the glory of the God who has saved us in in Jesus Christ, a a hunger to walk with our Saviour through each and every day. And and Lord, that it it might be our experience too uh, to uh, enjoy uh, your word as as treasure and pleasure. Lord, we pray that you would work in each of us and we ask this in Jesus' name as we say together. Amen. Uh, We're going to sing now a rendition of uh, this psalm, Psalm 19. So we're going to sing the words of uh, Book of Worship 19a, and we'll be singing uh, verses uh, 5 through 7, and you'll you'll see as we sing this psalm how it it picks up uh, all the the language of how precious and wonderful the Scriptures are. So let's uh, stand and sing, and after we've sung, uh, please remain standing for the benediction.
closing song will be the words of ancient words, again, as we uh, speak of the transforming uh, power of the Word of God. Uh, but now, uh, in faith, uh, people of God uh, receive uh, His blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.